looking at our new annual theme, uh, Grand Rising. It's been quite a grand journey. We started first with looking at it's a new dawn. And there we, we recounted the pandemic and how that changed our lives and the lessons that we learned. And even as uncomfortable and um, interesting as it was, we got good out of it. There was good that came out of that, learning how to do things a different way. And for us here, <laughs> spiritual community and church is not the same as it was pre-pandemic. Then we went to, it's a new day. And beginning each new year, as we do with re resolutions and intentions, we took a look at how the power of intention helps form our understanding of this kind of a new phrase for us, a new a grand rising, and what it means. And then we operate from, it's a new life. Out of those intentions, how do we go about creating a life that we love and honoring our vision of a world that works for everyone? And how can this spiritual home become a home for so many more? What are we called to do and be? And so today, today we're going to take a look at feeling good. Now you write, might recognize each of those segments as lyrics from a very well-known song called Feeling Good. It's a new dawn, it's a new day, it's a new life, and I'm feeling good. Yes. I don't know about you, but being called to be in service to serve as an example of love and light in the world. It really feels good. There isn't anything really I would rather do or be than to operate in the world in that way. So as you and I bring that energy of a grand rising into the rest of our year, let, let us remember that our voices matter, and collectively, one person, one prayer, one stone in the pond, we are changing the world. Now, I just referenced this a moment ago. The Centers for Spiritual Living, our vision statement is this, creating a world that works for everyone. It sounds wonderful. But i got to be honest, it's hard work. <laughs> Especially because the only place we can start with that is where? Ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> so this year we are being invited to put this vision into practice by what intentionally participating in a collective grand rising. We can ask ourselves some questions when we get into it. Well, what does the world look like that works for everyone? What does it feel like? What's going on in a world that works for everyone? And then if we're coming up with some ideas, maybe we can take some action steps that we can affect in our own communities. Not just this one, because we belong to lots of different communities, don't we? There's the community of our friends, the community of our families, the community where we work, the community where we play, the community where we beat drums, communities where we meditate, communities where we exercise. Yeah, communities where we live. Yeah, lots of different communities. So what action steps do we need to take in any of those communities? Just pick one to put that principle into practice. <coughs> you know, each one of us is, is here. We were bo born in this time, in this moment in history for a reason. 
we were, and we were drawn to Centers for Spiritual Living for a purpose. There's something that's resonating, that's calling, and you're answering the call. So as we start each day with a grand rising, we are creating that ripple across communities. And again, this year we're being invited to step out of our comfort zones, leaning into our healing work, sharing our truth and co-creating a world that works for everyone. And yeah, it feels really good. So how do, let's go back to this. How do we create a world that works for everyone? Ernest Holmes had a really good sense of what this could be like in sharing this from uh, Sermon by the Sea from Asilomar. That's one of his most famous talks. I believe it was one of his last ones. He says, find me one person who is for something and against nothing, who is redeemed enough not to condemn others, out of the burden of his or her own soul. And I will find another Savior, another Jesus, and an exalted human being. Find me one person who is no longer has any fear of the universe or of God or of man or of anything else. And you will have brought to me someone in whose presence we may sit and fear shall vanish as clouds before the sunlight. Find me someone who has redeemed his own soul, and he <coughs> shall become my redeemer. And find me someone who has given all that he has in love without morbidity, and I will have found the lover of my soul. Woo! That is really something. Very powerful. And so if we take this on and just, just sit with it for a minute, I think we can get the sense that living from this understanding will allow each one of us to live by example and inspire others to do the same. And this is how we lead and we guide each other to our collective grand rising. So let's start. For something and against nothing, that alone is one heavy duty proposition. It's one ominous undertaking. Where it starts though, if we can get to the place where we are for something and just always stand in that place, and never creep back to being against anyone or anything. It starts with our loving ourselves and loving each other. And that, my friends, is the center of science of mind teaching. I won't lie to you though, it can be really difficult to practice. How do we advocate for the growth and inclusion of all people when others seem to fight so hard against it. It will stop you dead in your tracks because it invites a conversation, maybe many conversations, to try to bring in compassion and understanding and consensus and getting off the need to be right. All that we do in our centers, our services, our classes, our workshops, our events, all of those things, and everything in between are designed to provide the infrastructure of how we go about making this change for ourselves, for the communities, for the planet. How we go about getting to that place where we are for something and against nothing. As it happens, we feel, our organization feels, that we are very uniquely designed to serve as the dedicated space for each one of us to lean into our beliefs, to the beliefs that serves us, serve us and become aware of the ones that need to change because they don't serve us anymore. So we can lean into our beliefs while also holding 
space and love for people who are not in agreement, who might disagree. We are being invited to be fearless, to live fearlessly, and to live our truth out loud, and lead with love, and trust spirit more fiercely and frequently than ever before. As we practice advocating for our beliefs and expressing love for everything else, we are consciously then co-creating a world that, yeah, as we continue to do this, begins to feel good for everyone. <laughs> I have to ask this because it's to the two-sided question. Have you ever noticed that when you are focused against someone or something, your thoughts and your feelings are chaos gone wild. Your body starts doing all kinds of things. Like your heart rate increases, your blood pressure shoots up, you might be subject to headaches and digestive distress, racing thoughts, and common sense flies out the window. Did you have any of that going on while I was just describing what happens when we are against stuff? You might. Now, let's flip that coin over. Close your eyes while I describe this, what's going on with us, when we are for something. When we focus on what we are for, we support and strive to become. Our thoughts are in high, a higher vibration. There are lower metabolic reactions. Our breathing becomes more even. Our heart rate slows down. Our blood pressure goes down. At various times as you come to this understanding, you might notice your heart rate going up just a little bit, but for the reason, because you're being inspired, inspired and excited. What's going on is that we are being empowered and recognizing how powerful we are. And we're gaining a sense of something that is calling and is waiting to be revealed that is greater. Your sense and your sensibilities are beyond common. And they are divine, because that is your true self coming out to play. Did you notice some changes in your metabolic functions as I was sharing that with you? More peaceful, gentle, kind of exciting. It feels good. It feels good. Marianne Williamson shares this, because what I just shared with you was two different sides of the same power. Humanity is a group of infinitely powerful creatures. You see, that power, that power doesn't care how you use it. We have a choice. The exercise that I just put you through kind of really illustrates that. It's either immersing ourselves in being for something or against something that creates a lot of energy and uses a lot of energy. If you're going to use that much energy, should it be for something good that makes you feel good? And what about this world that works for everyone? We are using that as a tagline to describe our global purpose. But really, how would it look? If I close my eyes, I can think of a bunch of different things. I, I see people that are, are walking around bright, cheerful, joyful, peaceful, enthusiastic, loving the life that they've been giving because they are assured of lots of different things. Love, the basic needs for walking around on the planet, knowing that there's always enough for whatever reason that we may need resources, there's always enough. Greed has gone by the wayside. And cooperation and co-creation. I'll tell you what, I will be so happy on the day I can wake up and if I happen to be looking at the morning news not be greeted with, there's been another shooting overnight. 
or there's been another carjacking or another burglary involving a stolen car crashing through windows and doors. There's not another war being started somewhere. I will be so happy. But I'm starting with my joy right now, knowing that it's possible. So it's time for you and I to start really giving some serious thought to what kinds of changes we can make individually and collect, collect, collectively to create that world that works for everyone. In what ways, for instance, could this center serve as an inclusive space for people from all walks of life and beliefs? I happen to think that our culture here is one of warmth and inclusion, as well as garnered by a fair dose of curiosity. Yes, we are a small community, but even in that, you can see diversity. Just look around. All kinds of diversity, I see. And yet, wait, there's more. We have room for more, the capacity for more. In what ways does our community perhaps have room for both? And we get to be the managers and the effectors of that. And it's been said that there is strength in numbers, and much of what we would like to see will require more hands and more feet. And still, as we are, we insist on doing what we can, where we're at, with who we are. And we have trust and know and believe that it is enough for now. A question here, do people with different ideologies feel welcome here? I hope so. I know so, because that's what we strive for. It is our differences that we share in life that, that serves as the meat of our practice and faith. You see, disagreement needn't be rancorous or acrimonious. It can be productive if we need it with an appreciation and a curiosity and a willingness to share and exchange ideas and leave the need to be right. All while focusing on the right to choose that belongs to everyone and not just a few. And when we do this, you'll notice something. We have really different conversations and sharing especially when we can approach seeming disparate ideologies in that way. So as we step into each new day or each new era, now is the perfect time really to start asking ourselves questions. You know, there's a lot of our centers who avoid hot button topics and political conversations to build a peaceful environment. But the, I gotta say this, the more we sweep stuff under the rug, the more that mound of undiscussed topics becomes <laughs> the size of an elephant and then the elephant in our room. There is a way to broach su subjects in a non-demeaning, demanding way. There is a way to do that. And we can be the leaders for setting the tone, not only in our <coughs> communities, but in our country. <coughs> Reverend Dr. Raymond Anderson shares this. And Raymond is a shaker and a mover in our in our movement. He um, he's out out east, back east. Um, he's really wonderful because he also serves as a sign language signer um, at our gatherings um, and conventions. So it's, uh, he's got multi talented person. <laughs> uh, Raymond shares this. He said a quote that works is not achieved by twiddling our metaphysical thumbs and singing Pumbaya, but by getting to the nitty gritty of what ails those in our centers, the neighborhoods and where centers reside and beyond. Change starts here within our own communities. So how do we do it here? What are we doing and what else is available or is calling out for us?
we can't talk about this thing called a ground rising without mentioning something about the effect of social media and the internet. The rise of the internet has increased opportunities for getting globally connected. So often those connections are bothersome, troublesome, but they offer a connection nonetheless. And let's be real here, the pandemic really inspired a lot of us to deepen that experience when we began to re-emerge and re-socialize and engage in more online contact than ever before. Our ability to connect and to communicate with each other has more easily set that stage for the big global shift. We are really on the edge of something that's happening. I can't ignore it, it's happening. And we are standing at the forefront of it. Those archaic structures, the patriarchy, white supremacy, and heteronormativity are being really dis dismantled across the planet. And we're beginning that shift into a new way of being. And Centers for Spiritual Living are uniquely equipped to lead us in that shift by providing tools that never fail. They always work if you use them. We've already began, uh, in the organization there's already been training provided to practice <coughs> non-judgment, inclusion, loving kindness <coughs> within our own communities. And we're not meant to be an organization restricted to teaching the law of attraction for individual gain or manifesting perfect parking spots. We are meant to feel good, to shine, to lead, and co-create a collective grand rising for everyone. Nicole Hannah-Jones in her work, The 1619 Project, shares this. Facing truth, facing the truth liberates us to build the society that we wish to be. That's really what we're up to, is all of last year we dealt with living out loud, which had it, uh, lots of talk about being authentic, being your true self, being willing to be curious, to telling the truth, facing the truth. Um, even in our own organization, we've had to do some work around this. Um, specifically, there's a, a subgroup within Centers for Spiritual Living called Next Gen. And Next Gen arose out of the recognition that there was a whole age group of people who were not very well represented in our centers, the 18 to 35 year olds. So leadership uh, team recognized that after um, our, our young people turned 18, many centers uh, were not prepared to meet their spiritual needs. And so as a result, people within that 18 to 35 year old demographic um, were really underrepresented throughout our, the movement. So um, they created the launch pad. Um, and then the next gen um, convention. And um, that was held in, the first one was at 2018 at the uh, Seaside Center for Spiritual Living. And now, because of the pandemic, they didn't have one for a few years. The last one occurred just this last October at um, our newly acquired Camp Cedar Ridge in Veronia, Oregon. Um, and I'm very happy to report that the 18 to 35 contingent in our movement is growing and they are adding a level of consciousness, of depth, of intention, and enthusiasm to our movement. And we are being richly blessed by their um, presence. So being the change that we want to see in the world is the best way to co-create a world that works for everyone. That's why 
I do Be the Change, every season for peace and nonviolence. Um, being the change um, is easier said than done, though. To be for something and against nothing, to lead with love, to participate in healing <coughs> discussions and taking responsibility for our own healing, and being the change that we want to see in our homes, then this is a home, it can feel really challenging and daunting. Well, the good news about that is, though, that when we can lean into our spiritual practices, we are serving as an example that inspires change within our own communities. And for us, we don't really need to worry about the how or the when. We just need to know what our what is. The how and the when is on God's terms. Just stay anchored in your practice. All we need to know is that when we focus on our own journey, the world around us, begins to shift. I know you know this. You've demonstrated it to, with, through, and for yourselves many, many, many times. Every time you've decided to take your life into a new direction, and you opened your heart and your mind to divine inspiration and took action that seemed appropriate, the world didn't appear the same, did it? I've healed situations and relationships by doing just that. Be aware though, it cannot be done in, in a just a one and done shot. Usually it takes like in a series of events <laughs> to cultivate and accumulate what we call critical critical mass. It's incumbent upon all of us to invest the time and the effort into ensuring that diverse people, all, all, all people, because all of us are diverse in our own way, have a measure of feeling good and receiving spiritual food from our centers. Honoring diverse voices must be at the core of our movement and our philosophy. And a collective grand rising calls and requires that all people from all walks of life have a seat at the table. So that's what we're doing. We're build, building and we're creating a bigger table so that more people can join in and have a seat at the banquet. So again, what some questions would you know we're we're kind of in that exploratory phase, that first phase, taking this on, learning a little bit more about it seeing for ourselves what is possible. So we've got some questions we might need to ask. Well, what does the world look like mean to you? You might want to put that down in your journal. Just explore that in your journal writings as you do your daily gratitude exercises. A world that works looks like dot, dot, dot. And start filling in after the dot, dot, dot. Here's a good one. As we look around in our center, and then this question asks, are the demographics of our center representative of the center's membership or location? Some, but not always. We're missing families, young children, teenagers, young adults, more men, and a whole host of other um, people from different walks of life. So we're pretty diverse as we go, but there's, wait, there's, there's more, there's more. So as you contemplate those things, I'm looking forward to listening and, and hearing some of your ideas for how we go about opening those, flinging those doors wide open. You know, it's, uh, I've said this before, it's been odd to me. This community's been here for 40 years. How is it that we're so not known? <laughs> Yeah, let's be out in circulation. So affirm with me now. I am co-creating. I am co-creating a world that works for everyone. A world that works for everyone. And so it is. And so it is.